This is a video essay about the tabletop game Heart, the City Beneath by Grant Howitt and Christopher Taylor. It contains spoilers for the text, as well as spoilers for Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, and for the Song Fiel season of the Friends at the Table podcast. Content warnings for this video include Unreality, Infection, Infestation of Bodies, Exploration and Colonization, Blood, Bees, Body Horror, Snakes, Consumption of Flesh, Living and Otherwise, Hypnosis, and Discussions about Being Compelled to Do Things Against Your Will, Generally Gross Descriptions, and Parasites. I've been thinking a lot about brain worms. Not brain worms the way we use the term online, but actual parasites. Gross, wriggling creatures that find their way into the body, sneaking through the blood-brain barrier, and making their nests between your neurons. You're probably familiar with the disease toxoplasmosis, caused by Toxoplasma gondii, because various studies claim it tricks your brain into liking cats. It affects up to half the population of the entire world, but like many parasites, it's typically harmless. However, not all parasites peacefully coexist with their hosts. In a September 2023 issue of Emerging Infectious Diseases, Hussain et al. published an article about an Australian woman who had been in and out of the hospital over a period of about 18 months, during which she complained of abdominal pain, diarrhea, and night sweats. As her care progressed, the patient developed gaps in her memory, depression, and a dry cough which did not respond to treatment. The doctors finally performed an MRI of the patient's brain and discovered a strange lesion in her right frontal lobe. When a biopsy was performed, the surgeons removed a live and motile helminth, measuring 8 centimeters in length, making it one of the longest parasites ever discovered infecting a human. While the story is lurid in its own right, what I found particularly interesting were its conclusions about how the poor woman in question came to house this nasty little creature. The species of worm, Ophidascarsis robertsi, is typically found in carpet pythons, not an animal people usually come in close contact with. However, the patient reported gathering wild New Zealand spinach from the lake nearby her home for cooking. The authors of the paper guessed that tiny O. robertsi eggs excreted from carpet pythons living in the lake must have contaminated the spinach, leading to her eventual infection. Parasites are tricky. They respond to changes in their environments and exploit them with thoughtless efficiency and their desperation to disseminate themselves. In no place is this clearer than in the declining moose population of Minnesota, where Paralipostrongylus tenuis, a nematode endemic to white-tailed deer, has jumped species. With climate change warming up regions which used to be too cold for deer to survive, herds have begun to share biomes with moose. Subsequently, moose end up sharing parasites too, parasites which evolve to be asymptomatic in deer but unfortunately result in terrible neurologic consequences for their northern cousins. I'm thinking about parasites in the context of climate change because their expansion feels intentional, like the world pushing back against humanity. We domesticate cats and adopt their diseases alongside them. We forage for plants, and parasite eggs hitch a ride in our salads. Temperatures rise with carbon emissions, and brain worms wriggle into interstitial spaces in the biome. That's the nature of parasites. They exploit those foolhardy or unlucky enough to stumble into a new environment, infect them, and repurpose their biological functions to perpetuate themselves. It's a little ironic. The more humans colonize the natural world, the more the world colonizes us back. Heart, the City Beneath is a game full of brain worms, explicitly referring to them in its text. Similarly, Annihilation is a novel about a parasite reality, an area that warps the people who enter it and uses them to expand its own borders. Since this essay is slated to go up around October, I thought it might be fun to examine the spooky aspects of these stories, concentrating on the text's various brainworms, and the ways in which those brainworms compel people to enter into their territory, infect them with strange magics and alien flora, and send them back out into the quote, civilized world further disseminating their influence. Let's start with this. 
both the heart and Annihilation's Area X did not seek to become parasites. Like climate change, they were prompted by human action, and, just like parasites, latched on with a ferocity that borders on intent. Little is known about Area X, at least in the first novel of the Southern Reach trilogy. It used to be a little town, with fishers and a lighthouse and a smattering of basic huts. It was more or less a nature preserve, in fact, Vandermeer thanks St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge in the novel's acknowledgments. But as far as the members of the various Southern Reach expeditions are told, it was a quiet community which one day, 30 years ago, was disturbed by an event. The event is never explained, and, as it becomes clear that the employers of the 12th expedition lied through their teeth about Area X, it's hard to know whether even the little bits of information we're told about it can be confirmed. But it allegedly existed next to a military base, which it is theorized caused some sort of accident that produced the strange dimension, an environmental catastrophe that no one really wanted to think about once government propaganda drip-fed stories about Area X into the most conspiratorial fringes of the media. For the purpose of this essay, let's assume that at least this is true. Area X, whatever its actual origins might be, did not become aggressive until humanity intervened. Until the disaster happened, until the military got curious, until the Southern Reach started sending its investigators. The heart, too, has always been there. If you watch my Spire essay, and, and you should, it's really good, you'll know that the heart is, technically, the center of the mile-high city itself, a chaotic aberration to balance out the unnatural order imposed by the High Elf Empire. In this new game, however, the heart is less a bizarre center and more a sprawling hellscape, an entirely different form of civilization under Spire's colorful districts. That's where the game gets its tagline. It's literally a city beneath. However, the book tells us the heart was not always the tortured network of tiered nightmares it is today. Two events stood out to me, two origins for the heart's carnivorous appetite. First is the Vermissian Incident. The Vermissian is an abandoned train system that, in theory, would have allowed for efficient and quick transit across Spire. Initially, the trains were a bureaucratic disaster of confused lines and factional squabbles. Despite the hole they found themselves in, the Elfair continued digging in an attempt to give themselves the space to fix their train network. Instead, they pierced the heart itself, and its chaos pumped raw magic into the Vermissian, twisting and cursing it into a dozen fractured dimensions, navigable only by brave knights and studious sages. While the government of Spire tried to cover the whole thing up, the Vermissian incident forever changed the city above, and accelerated the spread of the city beneath's warped reality. Of course, the Elphir never knew when to leave well enough alone, and several decades after the Vermissian incident, decided they'd had enough of the horror slowly leaking into Spire. They turned to that tried and true method of imperial problem solving, the military, and dispatched what would become the infamous 33rd Regiment of the Allied Defense Force to pacify the snarling wilderness. It went poorly. The Heart is not a place that takes kindly to the imposed order of empire. When Elphir officers ordered massacres of the Heart's inhabitants, monstrous or otherwise, whatever intelligence powers the realm dispatched its own defenders. Flesh walls that squeezed until muscle ran like water, cursed magic that knit rifle and hand and comrade into a tangled, ragged singular, legions of angels too terrible to behold, names permanently etched into the minds of their victims. Of the 900 doomed souls who set out to tame the heart, only 300 survived. And to say they survived is something of a white lie. The badges of those survivors became the legacy of the heart's hound class, but the soldiers themselves trudge on wandering the bunker on Tier 3 in a futile attempt to return home. What those fighters did to stop their imminent destruction is not entirely certain, though it is heavily implied they summoned a demonic incursion to save them from the heart's forces. But in saving themselves, they were also damned, 
forced to endure an endless campaign, transformed into creatures as monstrous as the act they committed. Between the Vermissian Incident, the 33rd's incursion, and the countless desperate explorers traveling into the heart's unfathomable depths, it's safe to say the heart was provoked. In response to these invasive maneuvers, the heart reacted, though whether the response was intentional, we cannot say. Like a good parasite, the heart discovered new ways to interface with the unlucky beings exploring its territory. It began to call out, and people answered. Have you ever heard of Zevenzolia? It's a city, a main plot element in the seventh season of the Friends of the Table podcast Song Fiel, which uses Heart as its base game. In it, an organization named the Rites of the Seventh Sun devotes themselves to constructing Utopia. Zevenzolia is, for all intents and purposes, heaven itself. A paradise so magical, so perfect, that the mere observation of a model of the city cures the ailments of those who look upon it. And, as is the case for someone stalking one of the player characters, a Vermissian or Shape Knight named Pikmin, changes the course of his life, turning him from a killer to a devotee. Alicus saint Geron, the Porcelain Knight, had Zevenzolia retroactively etched into his history. As soon as Pikmin laid eyes on the model of Utopia, Alakest's childhood was riddled with dreams of heaven. The first time he learned of the city, he fell sick for a week, so utterly consumed was he with the concept. And over the course of his 20 years as a Shape Knight, he gathered pieces of the legendary city, sculpting his porcelain armor out of its walls. That is the majesty and terror of Zevenzolia. To know its name is to know perfection. To know its name is to live a life compelled. I find fictional compulsions fascinating, especially in the context of horror. There's something so exciting about being drawn toward a terrible fate, flinging yourself willingly into its arms. Both Annihilation and Hard have these sort of compulsions in spades. When you learn about the settings of these texts, you understand that average folks would never want to set foot in one of these places, but for protagonists of a novel, or player characters of an RPG, there's got to be a reason, a seductive quality of these realms that cannot be ignored. Like flies to honey, they come willingly. For the main character of Annihilation, a woman referred to only as the biologist, the compulsion starts in childhood. She was a lonely kid, but loved to spend time near an overgrown pool in her backyard. Neglected by her parents, the pool became a haven for frogs, insects, and birds. The biologist studied the creatures in her backyard biome, making notes and drawings, until she could call each animal by name. Thus began her lifelong love of the natural world, one which helped her launch her professional career, which gave her the qualifications to become a member of an Area X expedition. However, before the biologist ever became compelled to cross the border, her husband, an EMT and ex-Navy medic, felt the pull. Their marriage had begun to disintegrate, and her husband, perhaps influenced by the scientists at the Southern Reach, or simply seeking an ultimatum to save or destroy their relationship, signed up as part of the 11th expedition. What tipped the biologist from curiosity into certainty was the night a year after her husband left for Area X when she investigated a strange noise in her kitchen. When she found her husband, still in his uniform, standing in front of the open refrigerator, gulping milk till it ran down his neck. He didn't come back right. There were gaps in his memory, a distance that wasn't there before, even during their marital arguments. He looked at the biologist like a childhood friend, someone who he had fond memories of, but didn't know a thing about. She could only stand one day reunited with her husband before she called the Southern Reach, who promptly arrived to take him into custody. He died of inoperable cancer six months later, just like every other member of the 11th expedition who, one way or another, 
found themselves back inside the world. The biologists had to learn what happened in Area X. Not because of some all-consuming love for her husband, but because of a compulsion to know more about the place that could change him so utterly. There are various motivations for player characters to enter the heart, many of which align with typical adventure backstories. Some delve to find adventure, the thrills of Spire tame in comparison to the unpredictability of what lies beneath. Perhaps blackmail, a force to march into hell on behalf of people who now hold your life in their hands. But for others, the heart song floats up from underneath the floorboards, calling out in ways only they understand. Strange omens, unearthly signs, repeated images, dreams in which they recognize something alien, something which begs them to come find it. The way Heart mechanically incentivizes players to follow their motivations is with beats, actions which, if completed, provide minor or major abilities to their characters. Beats for the Heart Song are perfect examples of the ways the Heart compels characters to submit to its thrall. Give the Heart a name that only you can understand. Witness an emissary of the Heart. Destroy a haven so the Heart can reclaim what it is owed. This playstyle encourages the behavior of the Heart once, rewarding characters for widening its influence, for opening themselves up and letting its essence pour into them. As play continues in Heart, Another major game system allows for reinforcement of compulsions. Instead of hit points trickling down to zero, Heart uses fallouts, which are representations of how various misfortunes affect player characters, mechanically and narratively. Some fallouts are pretty straightforward. If you take enough punches, you might suffer spitting teeth or get a ringing head. But if you suffer echo fallout, which is to say, fallout caused as a result of coming into contact with the strangeness of the heart, Things get real weird. You might develop strange appetites, causing you to seek out rusted metal and wriggling animals to reduce stress. The heart song might grow stronger, manifesting as an unshakable draw to a specific person or place, forcing you toward them. You may try to resist the pull, but the heart has many ways of drawing you in. Annihilation's compulsions, however, do not only stem from Area X. During their training, the leader of the 12th expedition, the psychologist, informed the rest of the incursion team that they would be put under hypnosis. Her justification was that crossing the border into Area X is traumatic and strange, that cognitive suppression was necessary in order for the mission to proceed. All members of the team consented, and once the expedition begins, simply wake up, already inside the danger zone. However, as they travel further toward their objective, it becomes clear that this hypnosis effect was not constrained to the border crossing. The brainworms had already taken root long before the expedition reached the tower. They let them in on purpose. Have you ever heard of Bell Metal Station? It was an outpost once, the headquarters of a band of knights who fought the roving trains that traced the shape across Songfiel an outpost doomed by a man named Kaelin, who had already succumbed to the call of Zevenzolia. You see, Kaelin sought admission to the rites of the Seventh Sun, like Alakest burned with the compulsion to build heaven on earth. And so, to prove his worth to the rites, he conducted a terrible experiment, designed a way to remove the soul from a person, to justify their enslavement. Zevenzolia needed builders, and the problem of labor some would have you believe, is that it is dreadfully expensive to pay people fairly. He took his lover to a cave, and through some infernal curse, changed flesh to steel, bone to wheels. What emerged was a wear train, a nightmare monster of gnashing teeth and betrayed howling, a being furious at its inability to die. For this, Kalen was rewarded, granted membership into the rites, given the task to transform the outpost of Bellmetal into the Tower of Zevenzolia. I bring up the sad story of Bellmetal Station as we talk about infection to remind viewers that, while we discuss viruses, unnatural compulsions, and metamorphoses formed by the chaos of the heart, that there are some kinds of sickness which have no physical pathogen. Greed, zealotry, 
and most of all, ambition? These two are a kind of worm. There is no parasite like a person who cannot stop. There is a tower, too, in Annihilation, the place where Area X's infection turns from metaphor to reality. The Twelfth Expedition comes upon an unmarked bunker, a structure that, to all others in the team, is a tunnel, given that it burrows deep into the swampy earth. The biologist cannot think of it as anything but a tower inverted, with a secret at its base she is desperate to uncover. Inside, there is an endless message scrawled on the wall in fungi. Where lies the strangling fruit that came from the hand of the sinner? I shall bring forth the seeds of the dead to share with the worms. On and on along the wall, deeper into the darkness. The biologist gets too close. While studying the words, she leans in, triggers some defense in the fungi, and a cloud of spores sprays into her nose. From this moment on, as soon as the smell of rotting honey tickles her senses, the biologist begins to change. In heart, there are infections that grant power, changes sought out by those seeking to become more than themselves. The most obvious example are the witches, who carefully guard strains of a blood disease which ties their very anatomy to the heart. These witches are beings of incredible power, using the black ichor inside their veins to kill with a look, mend minor ailments, or ascend to a true form, becoming a flickering, hungry, zoetrope horror. By contrast, the deep apiarists invite infection to keep the heart at bay. Committed to the rigid structure of the hexagonal and logical, deep apiarists are compelled to become a living hive, their bodies transforming into homes for magical bees. Of all parasitic relationships in the heart, the one between the apiarists and their hive is the most benevolent. Though the insects turn your guts to wax and make tunnels of your arteries, they share with their hosts incredible power to impose order upon chaos. See through the eyes of their apian companions, replace and repair any part of a damaged body with prosthetics of the swarm's creation, heal frayed nerves with a soothing narcotic sting. Perhaps the most direct comparison to Annihilation in all of Heart is found in the Deep Apiarist class. Not only is the major ability Annihilation one of the most powerful moves in the game, but how it outright states in the director's commentary that the Apiarist was the product of his reading the book and watching the film. The infection of the biologist progresses rapidly. Upon inhaling the spores, her senses sharpen, and the essence of Area X begins to literally take root. She can sense the otherworldly strangeness of the tower, perceives it as the fleshy esophagus of a massive animal. Furthermore, she can sense the ways in which Area X has changed the wildlife inhabiting it. She can feel the otters watching her as they play among the reeds. She recognizes a dolphin jumping from the water, has the brief, terrifying thought that its eye is unmistakably human. Her connection with Area X becomes so strong that it shields her from the second infection, that of the psychologist's mind control. When the group begins to waver in their commitment to the mission, the psychologist utters a command phrase. Consolidation of authority. She issues instructions to continue back into the tunnel, commanding the expedition to have positive feelings about this course of action and to not remember that the command was uttered at all. Only the biologist is immune to this hypnosis, though she pretends she's still enthralled for her own safety. And so, the next morning, when they discover the team's anthropologist in the tower, green ash spilling from her mouth, the biologist does not know who to trust. Among the dead anthropologist's possessions is a glass vial, a sample, presumably taken from whatever creature has written the endless rambling string of fungi across the wall. When the biologist examines the sample back at camp, it comes back as human brain tissue. Nothing makes sense in Area X. Each new discovery only raises more questions. The only thing of which the biologist is certain is that one infection has protected her from another, the psychologist's hypnosis, which was almost certainly used to send her teammate to her death. That infection, which she takes to calling the brightness, drives her onward, drawing her to the tower, where it promises real answers. The heart's maladies are rarely so benevolent as the infections of the witch and deep apiarist, or indeed, the biologist's protective brightness. 
The thesis of this essay actually comes from page 181 in Hart, during the description of the carnival. Howe and Taylor explicitly described the carnival as a brain worm, and doubled down by saying that the carnival is not the only brain worm to enter the heart. The carnival is essentially a viral curse, one which infiltrates subjects by graffiti on walls, by snippets of a child's song, until it becomes a full-blown outbreak of gaiety. Carriers of the virus are afflicted with an endless compulsion to dance, to laugh and sing though their bodies are malnourished and feet worn to bloody tatters. The cult of knives is another form of parasite, one which absolutely has intentions of its own. When a blade develops a taste for blood, it starts to talk to its owner, convincing them that an unsheathed dagger is a sin. They gather like-minded knives, accumulating in the hands of the weak-willed, and begin to enact their wicked agendas. The knives themselves take over the minds of their wielders, driving them to kill again and again, until their bodies are mere vessels for the will of the cult. If you stumble across a person pierced through with a dozen blades, you have not witnessed a murder. You've entered a hot zone, and are now at risk for a sharp and glinting infection. Possibly my favorite setting element in all of Heart is the Labyrinth Curse. Physicians don't know exactly how it's spread. Like the carnival, it may be mere exposure. Whatever its transmission, its symptoms are by far the most noticeable of any illness, as it compels its hosts to build. They'll start small, stacking boxes around their apartments, concealing entryways to confound guests. But once the infected gather in numbers, their ambitions scale in dramatic fashion. Together they assemble a maze, sprawling, crooked, cobbled together with anything and everything they can get their hands on. Traps, wild animals, pitfalls, the works. Labyrinth communes can swallow whole cities, obscuring streets and landmarks with impossible architecture. Furthermore, the curse drives its sufferers to steal valuables from nearby homes, placing them deep within the maze. They get a sense of satisfaction from defending these objects, emboldening them to further expand their network. And all the while, as the infected add layers to each twist and a false ending to their masterpiece, a deep, anguished moan rumbles up between the brick and its mortar, waiting, yearning to be free. And the thing I like about Heart is that it indulges those impulses to build. It's a game whose tools are all about ramping up to dramatic moments, making poor decisions, setting those guns on your narrative mantle place because you're excited to stumble upon the cult of knives or follow that mournful howl deep within the labyrinth. You want to get infected, not just for the power it imbues your characters, but for the tragic end those infections promise. You welcome the worm as it tunnels deeper into your brain. Like Annihilation's biologist, like Kaelin Fell Dynestia, ambition draws players in. They can't stop. Not until the seventh sun shines bright above the clouds. Not until they find what lies hidden at the base of the tower. Have you ever heard of Rocco's Basilisk? In July of 2010, a user of the Less Wrong Artificial Intelligence Forum who went by the name Rocco proposed a thought experiment. They suggested that in the future, a super AI would come to exist, one which would be so powerful that it could use virtual reality simulations to torture every person who knew of its potential to exist, yet did not devote their whole lives to developing it. Similar to Pascal's wager, it would then be in everyone's best interest to entirely redirect their lives to building the basilisk, an attempt to avoid super hell by way of VR. Now I generally think anyone who lends too much power to AI is at best a credible fool, but the basilisk was successful in one regard. It scared the shit out of fools. Users who read the initial post claimed the basilisk began to haunt their dreams. The forum owner went as far as to remove mentions of it from the site. But the concept of the basilisk itself demands knowledge of it to be circulated, as the more people who know of it, the more builders become available to bring it into the world. The basilisk became one of the core concepts inspiring Songfiel's Zevnzolia, the rights of the seventh son driven to build Utopia by the very knowledge of it. The idea burrows into their brains, warps its hosts through greed or ambition or plain old fear, and then demands dissemination, accumulating devotees like Kaelin, and to a lesser degree Alakest, so its influence might grow. 
That's the thing about parasites. They spread. The heart has many methods of spreading itself further, writing itself into the world of those who have delved too far. The hounds, for instance, all descend from a member of the 33rd Regiment, having claimed their badge as proof of their allegiance. But the badge itself is a vector for the heart, the curse of the 33rd resonating back to those who'd claim their legacy. Of the many ways a hound can meet their end in heart, two involve alteration of physical space. In the everlasting stand zenith move, a hound commits to defending a specified location forever, retroactively inducting themselves into the 33rd, the name of the badge changing to reflect that of the character. The regiment will indefinitely protect the landmark, the transformed character keeping solemn vigil alongside them. In the incursion zenith move, the player smashes their badge, unleashing a temporal shift that transforms their immediate area into the last moments of the 33rd, and the horror they unleashed. Trenches and barbed wire sprout from the earth like weeds. Gunfire and shaking bayonets pierce anything that moves. The place you inhabit is destroyed utterly, forever scarred by the heart's revenge on those who invaded it. Blood witches, too, are destined to spread out into the world. In the sacred church of Hollow, the eldest and most powerful of the witches gather underneath fibrous catacombs to be interred. The witches cannot truly die, not in a way that matters. Their bodies sink into the wet muscle of the heart itself, returning their gifts to its source. In time, they too will expand along with the heart. Literally. In addition to people being spread across the heart, physical spaces can also develop the capacity to transmit themselves across increasing distances. There is an ordinary room that, every once in a while, will simply appear in the city beneath. Nothing particularly weird about it. Kitchen, art, a few books, a plain bed. The difficulty comes when you open the door at its other side and discover an identical copy of the very same room. Like many of the heart's viruses, the room replicates at a remarkable pace, to the point where you might move through hundreds of identical flats and never quite reach its end. Furthermore, upon examination, the items are wrong. The books are by authors who never existed, the plates bear fruit from alien trees. And if you take an item out of the room to be studied, you might find that after some time, the room you left it in also begins to change, growing into a replica of its place of origin. This becomes especially dangerous if you bring the seed of the room into a building connected to many other rooms, as mere proximity can shift your whole apartment complex into a series of identical suites. To me, the most interesting example of the heart's desire to grow are what the text describes as heart seeds. The heart experiments, it says. And while these experiments take many forms, an altar of calcified bone to some idea of divinity, or a clockwork module woven with teeth and hair, the most interesting to me is the heart seed of the Haven Domain. A drow child, huddled and shivering, at the center of the chaos. They babble incoherently, recycling words they've heard whilst in their larval state. They are able to tell your name by looking directly into your eyes. The idea that the heart would produce a person is fascinating to me. That it's conducting experiments at all suggests some form of intelligence and motive, but creating a person is intentional. There's no indication that the child's evil or malicious, only that it has a strange ability. But that's the fun thing about tabletop games, is that they are tools to scaffold your imagination. If you can already tell, I'm making quite a few leaps in this essay, but that's, you know, kind of the point. I like to imagine this little heart seed child is the next phase in the heart's expansion above its realm, its attempt to understand the people who keep coming into it, a literal set of eyes with which to survey the places beyond its reach. It's easier to infiltrate a host if they welcome you in with open arms. As Annihilation climbs to its climax, the biologist finds the psychologist, dying, already half consumed by some fungal growth. The psychologist then illuminates some of the truth. The border of Area X, perhaps once contained to the lighthouse by the shore, is advancing. Perhaps now it moves slowly, but she theorizes that in the future it might swallow up miles of land at a time. Whatever the Southern Reach hopes to get out of their expeditions, they're ultimately still without answers about limiting Area X's growth. It's not just the border of Area X that's expanding, however. 
Area X has already infiltrated the real world. The biologist finds a room full of hundreds of journals at the top of the lighthouse, including one left by her husband a year earlier. In it, he describes a procession, eight members of his expeditionary team heading into the tower, the place with writing on the walls. Among this procession is an exact replica of himself. I had such a blank look on my face. It was so clearly not me, and yet it was me. This journal entry confirms what the biologist suspected many months ago. Her husband hadn't returned, not really. The members of the 11th expedition were lost, perhaps, as the human-eyed dolphin implies, transformed into Area X itself. And whatever came back across the border, doppelgangers, clones, Area X's own version of Heartseeds, was something else entirely. This cloning process has already taken place before the novel finishes. When the biologist returns to camp, she finds a note from one of her colleagues. The anthropologist tried to come back, but I took care of her. By this point in the story, the biologist is the last surviving member of the 12th expedition. The brightness inside her continues to flourish. She's literally glowing as a result of its bioluminescence. After reading dozens of journals, confronting the psychologist, and barely surviving a shootout with the team surveyor, there is truly no other place to go but down. The biologist descends to the base of the tower. I can't describe what she finds there, not really, no matter how many times I read the scene. Annihilation's a brisk 200 pages, it's well worth checking out yourself. But to flatten something incomprehensible, I'll just say that the biologist has an encounter with something, and afterwards, she's able to form a theory of what Area X is. Think of it as a thorn, perhaps. A long, thick thorn so large it is buried deep in the side of the world, injecting itself into the world. Emanating from this giant thorn is an endless, perhaps automatic, need to assimilate and to mimic. Imagine, too, that while the tower makes and remakes the world inside the border, it also slowly sends its emissaries across that border in ever greater numbers so that in tangled gardens and fallow fields, its envoys begin their work. This is the nature of parasites. Hark with its living experiments, Area X with its misprints, Zevenzolia with its ceaseless demand to be built. Like seeds in fertile soil, these worms find purchase in the minds of the vulnerable. They germinate and utterly change the people they infest, and they sprout seeking to repeat the cycle again and again and again. Intentional or not, a parasite seeks only to self-perpetuate and will exploit every opportunity to do so. That's the price of ambition, the risk of delving into the dark, of exploring places where things much older and stranger than ourselves still slumber. You might find exactly what you're looking for, but you might bring back something that wanted to get out. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. I worked really, really hard on this one. So if you or someone you know is into heart, annihilation, or friends at the table, uh, please consider telling them about this essay. Uh, also, a big thank you to Connor Fawcett and Terrence Hector, who provided their lovely illustrations of The Red Zephyr and Zevenzolia. Uh, also, a huge thank you to Super Dylan, who did the incredible voiceovers from the quotes from Annihilation. Um, you can find links to their profiles in the video description, but Connor is on Twitter at TheBadBucket, Terrence is on Twitter at TMHector, and Dylan is on Twitter at SuperDylan. I also want to thank Jack DeKeet for letting me use their music from the Song Feel soundtrack in this video. Uh, you can find their music at notquitereal.bandcamp.com. Uh, and if you liked any of the stuff I said about Song Feel, I highly recommend you check out the Friends at the Table podcast at friendsatthetable.net. If you want to find more of my work, I'm at aavoit on Blue Sky, Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoit.com, where I talk about tabletop games, uh, writing, and health policy. I also do two podcasts. The first is Mortify the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis of various uh, media properties. Uh, and I also do another show, uh, The Bible Boys, where me and my ex-evangelical friends Michael and Josh talk about Christian media. Uh, we're about to start our spooky season, so if you like uh, religious e-horror stuff, uh, please check that out. 
Uh, again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, have a happy Halloween, and uh, don't let the brain worms bite.